think I'd settle for that. Well, good morning. And thank you for all you people who aren't at the cabin or at the lake today. Dear Lord Jesus, we just thank you for the opportunity of coming here together in your name. And your Holy Spirit is already among us. I pray that you'd fill our hearts and our minds with your words and illuminate your word for us. In Jesus' name, amen. So let's turn to the person next to us and say, thank God you're here. <laughs> when we were looking at this uh, sermon series, um, what after I had come back from... A little holiday fishing, you know, the, all the people that are in the sermon design team, they had done all this work, and then they said, well, Kelly, you can, you know, we'll, what we'll do is we'll, we'll take this Bible story book, and we talked about this for a while, and this Bible story book is all based on allegories, how we find uh, Christ in every story of the Bible, if it's a, no matter whether it's a story about David, or, um, or in this case, it's uh, Abraham and Isaac, we're going to find uh, a story about Jesus. We're going to find how Jesus is mentioned in this. And we see and experience and hear uh, the perfect name of Jesus in all of these stories. And so I thought, well, this is pretty good because we can just do Bible stories and it's going to be pretty simple. But, you know, for the last few days, I've been going back and looking at Abraham or Abraham's life again. And, you know, when you go back and read it again and again, uh, it's like... Um, you know, for me, these past couple of days, it's been uh, Abraham overload. And you just see how God uh, used this man powerfully and how the name of Christ just permeates from his story. So the main text, so we're going we're gonna to look at, at Abraham out of uh, the book of Genesis. But the main text, I just want you, maybe we just forward to the next text. This is the text I want you to have uh, on your mind you know, if you can read, it's a little small today, but let me read it out to you. But it's not, out of, it's not out of Genesis, and it's not even from Abraham. It's Jesus Christ saying out of Mark 10. Yes, Jesus replied, I assure you that everyone who has given up house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or property for my sake and for the good news will receive now and in return a hundred times as many houses brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and property, and along with this persecution. And in the world to come, that person will have eternal life. But many who are the greatest now will be the least important then, and those who seem the least important now will be the greatest then. And you know, if I, uh, I look at Abraham, or Abram now, and here's this, Man called of God in Genesis chapter 12. Let me read this very similar text. The Lord had said to Abram, leave your native country, your relatives and your uh, father's family, and go to the land that I will show you, and I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous, and you will be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you and those who treat you with contempt and, and curse those who treat you with contempt. All the families on earth will be blessed through you. And Abraham departed as the Lord instructed and Lot went with him. Abraham was 75 years old when he left Haran. There once was a man named Abraham who was 75 years old. And even by biblical standards in those days, he was a pretty old guy. He had friends and a family and a life. And God says, I have a plan for you at 75 years old. 
I want to push you out of your old life and pick you up and put you into a new life. Walk away from the things that you have now and come and follow me. Leave all the things that you're familiar with. Leave all the things that you're comfortable with. Leave all the things that you know and come and follow me. Stop what you're doing right now. Leave your home and walk away. God called Abraham to leave behind everything he loved and cared about. I want to make a nation of you. I want to bless the entire world through you, Abram. Because of what you are about to do, the world will be saved. And it says that Abraham said, okay. And if we read in James chapter 2, verse 23, it says... Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. And because of this, Abraham was called a friend of God. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to walk away from everything that you're familiar with, everything that you know to be true, all your comforts, all your friends, all your family. Anyone who gives up house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or property for my sake and for the good news will receive now in return a hundred times as many houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and property along with that persecution and the world to come, uh, that person will have eternal life but many who are the greatest now will be the, uh, will be the least important then, and those who seem least important now will be the greatest then. Can you see the similarities between these two texts? One to Abraham, the other to us. Come and follow me. Leave everything behind. Come and follow me. And Abraham was... Naive, faithful, foolish? You tell me. He just said, okay. And he walked away. And because of that, it was credited to him as righteousness, to be right with God. It was a good thing. But also because of that, God, God called him what? Friend. Friend. Now, what kind of friend asks you to give up everything? You know, I have friends that come and say, Kelly, can I borrow your lawnmower? Now, I have a pretty nice lawnmower, so you'd have to be a pretty good friend. But I don't think I've ever had a friend who's come to me and said, can I have your house and your car and your wife and your children? What kind of friend Ask us to give up everything. <coughs> Abraham heard the voice of God. And he just said yes. And he followed him. Abraham, I'm going to make a covenant with you. You are an old man, and your wife is well past the years where she can have a baby. Yet you will have a son. And through your lineage... I am going to save the world. I've asked Lorelai to read an easy piece of scripture to us today. Okay, not so easy, so forgive me in advance. <laughs> I'll be getting the names wrong, I'm sure. <laughs> anyway, a uh, record of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. 
Abraham was the father of Isaac. And Isaac, the father of Jacob. Jacob, the father of Judah and his brothers. Judah, the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. Perez, the father of he Hezron. Hezron, the father of Ram. Ram, the father of Aminabab. Aminabab, the father of Nasson. Nasson, the father of Salmon. Salmon, the father of Noaz, or Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Bo Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Obed, the father of Jesse. And Jesse, the father of King David. David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. Solomon, the father of Rehoboam. Rehoboam, the father of Ab Abijah. <laughs> Abijah, the father of Asa. Asa, the father of Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat, the father of Jehoram. Jehoram, the father of Uzziah. Uzziah, the father of Jotham. Jotham, the father of Ahaz. Ahaz, the father of Hezekiah. Hezekiah, the father of Manasseh. Manasseh, the father of Amon. Amon, the father of Josiah. And Josiah, the father of Jeconiah. And his brothers and all the time of exile to Babylon. After the exile to Babylon, Jeconiah was the father of Sheltiel. Sheltiel was the father of Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel, the father of Abiad. Abiad, the father of Eliakim. Eliakim, the father of Azor. Azor, the father of Zadak. Zadak, the father of Akim. Akim, the father of the Iliad. Iliad, the father of El Eliezer. Eliezer, the father of Mathen. Mathen, the father of Jacob. And Jacob, the father of Joseph, the, the husband of Mary, and of whom was born Jesus, who was the Christ. Thus, there were 14 generations in all from Abraham to David, 14 from David to the exile of Babylon, and 14 from the exile to the Christ. And just so you know, I read Matthew chapter 1, 1, 2, 17. And I didn't tell you to start with because I didn't want you to get my names all wrong. <laughs> so as Laura Light's brushing her teeth, getting ready to come to church today, I said I have a piece of scripture for you to read. I'm going to hear about that later, I think. That's true love. I want you to leave your family. I want you to walk away. I want you to follow me. And you're going to be the person that I start a covenant with that's going to lead to Jesus Christ and the salvation of the world. And, you know, Abraham was not uh, totally perfect. He made lots of mistakes. One of the things he doubted, he doubted that uh, how this would actually happen. And one of the pieces of text, which is very mysterious, is out of Genesis 5, 70 to 21. And I just wanted to read this part to you. After the sun went down, God gives him a vision and tells him that he's going to uh, keep his word. After the sun went down and darkness fell, Abraham saw a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch pass between the halves of the carcasses. What God had him do is to take a uh, th uh, three-year-old heifer, three-year-old female goat, a turtle of an pigeon, but he took the, the, the uh, heifer and the goat and he separated them and he put them in halves. And then in a vision, uh, Abraham saw this fire pot go between the pieces. Now, do you know why he did that? Hmm? Making a covenant. A blood covenant. Now, in these days, it was, uh, it was uh, customary that if you entered into an agreement with somebody, a big agreement, you might seal it with the blood of an animal. And it would be on, on a curse. So if you didn't keep your word, you would be cursed. So to build Abraham's confidence, to tell Abraham that he was going to keep his word, that he would, he would uh, build this nation, that he said, I am entering in to a blood covenant with you. And be it 
ever so harsh on me as God if I don't keep my word. Can you see the significance in that? That God himself is entering into a blood covenant with Abram, saying, what I'm going to do with you, I promise on my own name. There's nothing greater than than any promise that can ever be made other than I would swear on my own name. So whoever gives up their brothers and sisters, father or children or property, for my sake and for the sake of the gospel, the good news, will receive a hundred times as many houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, children and property along that with persecution. Can you see the similarity here? A blood oath. Abraham was given a blood oath by God. We are given a blood oath by Jesus Christ. Abraham was used to start the lineage from which the Messiah, Jesus Christ, would come to change us. And you know, this is great, powerful news. And then, you know, uh, as as. Abraham is waiting for God to keep his promise because he's an old man. He's waiting for this son to come. He grows impatient because God doesn't act according to the way he thinks he should act. So what does he do? He helps him out. And so between Himself and his wife, they concoct a plan because Sarah has not become pregnant. And so Sarah says, well, I have a handmaiden. Take her. So they give God a hand. And from that, they get Ishmael. Now, I'm not going to go into the big story of Ishmael, but Ishmael was not the chosen person from God. But what I wanted to do is to bring this point forward. We have a blood oath from God for us when we walk away from the things that he's called us to walk away from. Children, property, houses. I read this and I think, Abraham, what a bonehead. Didn't you have this proof positive that God was entering into a blood covenant with you and yet you still had to help him out by creating an Ishmael? Have we ever created an Ishmael? Have have you ever, this is the point we're trying to get at. I don't want to go to the whole story because we'd be here all day. But do you understand that by trying to help God out, we don't help him out at all? We create Ishmael's. I'd like to tell a story about an Ishmael. We had uh, friends of ours who were we, who we were in ministry with together, and they ended up uh, separating and finding other couples because they wanted to find happiness in some other person. So they created an Ishmael and they said it was of God and it never was. And to this very day, every time I think of this story, I think about them and how they were our best friends and now they're apart. I, that's just one story, but I'm sure all of us have created Ishmael's times when we, when we tried to help God out and he really didn't desire our help. All we had to do was be patient and wait for him. And he would have kept his word because why? Because his word was on a blood oath. Of course I'm going to keep my word. I told you I was going to keep my word. Remember God swore an oath on his own name that he would bless Abraham that he would be his friend and that he would do the impossible. 
when Abraham, uh, Genesis chapter 17, when Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am El Shaddai, meaning God Almighty. Serve me faithfully and live a blameless life, and I will make a covenant with you by which I guarantee to give you countless descendants. God said, I am the Almighty. I can do the things that you can only imagine. I can do the things that you can't imagine. I'm even going to change your names. Abraham, your word means father. But I'm telling you, you're going to be a father of many, a father of nations. So, or Abram, so change your name to Abraham, which means father of nations. And Sarah... You know, that's mother. Your name is going to be changed to Sarai. Your name is mother. I'm going to change it to Sarah. That means queen or mother of many. And what you're supposed to do to mark this covenant, he says in Genesis chapter 17, then God said to Abraham, your responsibility is to obey the terms of the covenant. (coughs) I have made a blood covenant with you and I want you to obey them. You and all your descendants have this continual responsibility. This is the covenant that you and your descendants must keep. Each male among you must be circumcised. You must cut off the flesh of your foreskin as a sign of the covenant between you and me. From generation to generation, every male must be circumcised on the eighth day after his birth. This applies not only to members of your family, but also servants born to your household and foreign-born servants whom you have purchased. Abraham was impatient. Sarah was impatient. They had proof uh, positive uh, that God was going to keep his word, but they were getting older, so they created an Ishmael. But God kept his word in spite of their best efforts. And he gave them a son. And they called him Isaac, which means laughter. The Lord kept his word and did for Sarah exactly, exactly what he had promised. Even though Abraham had sinned in the middle. Do you know that uh, it strikes me that Abraham had sinned a few times. Uh, he was a little concerned that somebody might want to take his wife. So he called his wife's sister, his just his sister, to the Pharaoh and to King Abimelech. Got them in trouble. He laughed at God when God told him what he was going to do. And so even though he was unfaithful in creating an Ishmael, God continued to be faithful to him. Just like when we receive Christ as our Savior and we mess up or screw up or make mistakes, he continues to be faithful to us even when we are not faithful. The Lord kept his word. He did exactly, exactly what he was said he would do. She became pregnant and gave birth to a son for Abraham in his old age. The impossible thing. This happened at just the time God had said it would. And Abraham named their son Isaac eight days after he was born. Abraham circumcised him as he was commanded. Abraham was 100 years old. Now the story should end here. Abraham had messed up. He had been unfaithful several times. He doubted God, so God had to give him a sign and a vision. And now he has Isaac, and everything seems that it should be okay. But this is really where our story starts today. We just gave you the background information, a little bit of the background information. But now, after Isaac is born, after after the, the, the world should start to be populated with Abraham's seed and he should be this, this, uh, this father of nations. It all makes sense now because, you know, Ishmael was a mistake. Sorry about that, God. Now we move on to Isaac. Okay, now let's build the nation. Let's, let's, let's just move on with this thing. What does God ask him to do? Sometime, it's Genesis chapter 22, verses 1 to 2. Sometime later, God tested Abraham's faith. Abraham called, God called Abraham. 
Yes, he replied, here I am. Take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love so much, and go to the land of Moriah. Go and sacrifice him as a burnt offering on the, one of the mountains, which I will show you. So Abraham now, 100 years old, over 100 years old. He takes his son, says, here, son, you carry the wood. I'll carry the fire. So Abraham probably had a coal. They go to the top of the mountain. He ties his son up to the altar. And the son says, Daddy, aren't we supposed to have like a lamb? Isn't there supposed to be something to sacrifice? And what does Abraham say? God will provide. Now, I'm not sure about you, but it seemed there was a lot of work that went into getting Isaac into the world. And if I was Abraham, I would be a little concerned about the very fact that it took a lot just to get this son. And now God is asking me to take a knife and to kill my child. The only hope that God could keep his promise, the only hope that I think he could keep his promise, the only way I can imagine that he might keep his promise, now I'm about to do it in. How are you going to have a nation? How are you going to save the world if I kill Isaac? Isaac is the, is the start of the whole thing. He raises his hand, and the angel says, stop. And so he stops. I want to come back to our verse that we, I wanted you to hold in your mind. I assure you, I assure you, Jesus Christ says, I assure you that anyone who has given up house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or property for my sake and for the good news will receive now in return a hundred times as many houses, brothers, mothers, children, and property along with that persecution and in the world to come will have eternal life. But many who are the greatest now will be the least then. And those who seem the least now will be the greatest then. <clears throat> Abraham, I want you to leave your family, leave your life, leave those things that you have grown accustomed to and comfortable with. And I'm going to make you a father of nations. To us today, Jesus is saying, come and follow me. All those things that you've grown accustomed to, all those things that you've grown comfortable with, come and follow me, and I will give you eternal life. And those things, those people that you think are so important now, the stuff that you think is so worthwhile now, well, in the end they won't be. But those things that maybe seem the least important to you now, those are the things that will be the most important. In the same way that we try to help God out, <coughs> Abraham tried to help God out with Isaac's, I mean, we are with Ishmael's. We have Ishmael's in our lives. We try to make things better by being better people or doing good works while well, those things just don't work. And God exposes those things. And then he gives us what is truthful and real and honest. And that's to follow him. I, I, I doubt that if God had given Isaac to Abraham right away, 
that he would have been able to raise that knife. I think he had to go through his entire life experience of, of, of having a, the, the brazier, the fire go between the blood offering to show that God was truthful in his word. He had to see that. He had to live some lies and be forgiven for them. He had to see that God was for him even when he was being stupid or foolish. He had to experience a few Ishmaels in order to appreciate the Isaac to the point where he knew that at the end of the day when he brought Isaac to the place of actual sacrifice that somehow he could trust God with the outcome. It took a lifetime to get there. I doubt sincerely he could have done it at the very beginning. He had to have some experience. We were out on the water yesterday with some friends. And uh, one of my friends said to me, she says, uh, you know, you'd think that as we got older, we would stop having such crazy ideas. And I said, what do you mean? Well, there's this empty cabin over there. Wouldn't that make a fantastic retreat place for broken Christians? It's an empty cabin. It's been empty for, you know, for years. And, and it has some kind of covenant on it where it can only be used by church organizations. And she was all sort of excited about this idea. And she, she, she said to me, you know, it just seems that the older I get, the more I'm willing to risk. Because the more experience I have in God, to know that at the end of the day, there will be a ram. There will be an offering. I don't have to guess as much anymore. I have more confidence. And my ideas are a little more crazy these days. The best is yet to come. God did his most significant work in Abraham's life, near the end of his life. The last thing I wanted to ask you is that what things do we need to bring to the altar? Like I'm thinking that there are things in our lives that uh, we can sacrifice. That will bring us closer to God. Even the things that we think that are important. I think in Abraham's life, Isaac was pretty important. I think he could see his entire future. In the life of Abraham, or in Isaac. And God said, raise the knife and take your son's life. What, what stuff what things could we lay on the altar? Like, it, what things would we, the important things that with the history and the knowledge of our life that we've lived now, our past, our present, and our future, the, if you add up the total sum of our life experience in Christ, what things could you risk now, knowing full well that if you did risk them, that God would provide a ram in the thicket. What, 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 what are the things now that we could lay on the altar that if we were to give up to God now, that the kingdom of God would grow? I assure you, 
that anyone who has given up house or brothers or mother or father or children or property for my sake and for the good news will receive now and in return a hundred times as many houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and property. But along with that, some tough stuff, some persecution. And the world to come will have eternal life. But many who are greatest now will be least important then. The, the, perhaps the things that we put on the altar aren't that important. But many who are greatest now will be least important then, and those who seem least important now will be greatest then. Father God, you started your, your road to save us through the life of Abraham, and we can see that through his lineage, the Messiah came. And he struggled at some level with being honest and being truthful, and yet you remained faithful. But at the end, you built his life in such a way that when it came time for his single greatest accomplishment to lay Isaac on the cross, you gave him the courage to do what he was called to do. I do not believe he could have done that to begin with. And now here we are today. We're the same kind of people. I just sense that your, your desire for us is to be used to extend the kingdom of God in much the same way that you used Abraham to bless the nations. That's what you called us to as a church and as believers. So today, Lord, if there's something that we need to put on the altar to raise the knife to, I suspect we have enough life experience here in this room and in our lives to know that you will provide a ram. That it's not an impossible risk to follow you. I suspect, Lord, that the only risk would be not to follow you. So I'm going to ask, just in the next while here, if you would show us in your hearts, in our hearts, what, what actually needs to be laid on the altar? What can we lay on the altar? What, what Isaac can we lay on the altar? What are the, um, what are the things we need to confess to lay on the altar so that your kingdom can grow. That that same call you had on Abraham is the same call you have on us because it's the same call that you gave Jesus to tell us that anybody who gives up their life here to come and follow me will receive eternal life. A hundred times that more in this world than in the next. Holy Spirit of the living God, just open up our hearts and our minds now to what it is we need to put. Any Ishmaels? What Ishmaels are we following? How have we tried to help you out, God, when really we just made a mess of it? Those things can be put on the altar. The things that we hold dear and, and love the most, they could be put on the altar too because we can trust you with all of that. Holy Spirit of the living God, just come and speak into our hearts now. Empower us, enable us to see those things with clarity and to know at the end of the day, you will keep your word because it's a blood oath. In Jesus' name, amen.